for many of, if not all, the nights this week, so welcome. I want to just ask for a moment of reflection to just look around the room. Just take a moment to look around the room. I was a youth minister for over 20 years, and youth ministry can be a very isolating practice. You have your kids, you care for your kids, you never see a youth minister from another church, you're working as hard as you can to keep up with the kids in your care. But look at this room. We've got 175 folks signed up this week who all love kids, care for kids, amen? And I want you to hold this thought if you would. Sarah and I and the team that you see all around you have been working for a year, actually for about two years to set tonight up because when you get the kind of scholars that we're bringing in, you need to be getting on their schedule two years in advance. We've been pointing towards tonight for two years and praise God, you're going to see the leaders in their field all week long, beginning tonight. But here's what I want you to hold in your mind and heart. You can learn as much from the person across from you at your table as you can from the folks at the podium. We have 175, more than 100 on every night, folks who have been in the trenches, loving kids, caring kids, and coming up with responses that God revealed to them in their church, in their group, that we can share. So if you just sit at your tables and look up here all week, and try to listen to what comes from here all week, you're gonna be missing half the show. Half the show is at your tables. So the first thing I wanna ask you to reflect upon is how can I go through this week trying to figure out, I got 100 teachers in this room and I wanna drain every idea I can from them before I go home, all right? Now, now I got another way of thinking about the same thing. I want you to think about how challenging youth ministry is in our times. I hope that you are at a church where they give you too much money, too much support, the kids come too often, and the parents back you up all the way. Anybody, anybody got that one? All right, I hope, but, but if that's not you, maybe, maybe your experience is, it's tough out there. It's tough for our kids. It is tough being an adolescent today. And it's tough in churches with scarce resources and scarce budgets to continue to even fund youth ministry. And it's tough to get the kids time because the parents are exhausted and the kids are all over. The this is tough work. There are, I know you already know that some of the greatest joys you will ever experience in your life, you will experience in youth ministry. But I'll bet you also know your heart will be broken over and over again in youth ministry. So if we're going to turn this around and care for our kids in a way that God wants them cared for, then we're going to have to create a movement. It's not going to be any one program that a school does from a podium. It's not going to be any one good heroic minister. It's going to be folks linking arms, sharing passion, praying for one another, encouraging one another, supporting one another, getting their churches together, learning from one another. That movement is possible just in the 175 folks who are gonna be coming to this program this week. So I hope, I hope you enjoy being here with a good friend or a colleague from your church. You probably already drained their pond of the good ideas, right? And you already probably got a sense of movement and collaboration with the folks. I hope you will be bold enough to learn the names of the folks at your tables that you don't know, that you didn't come with, that aren't from your church, and maybe even be bold enough to swap tables during the week so that by the end of the week, we know each other. We have worshiped together, we have prayed together, we have learned from one another, and we go from this place, a force for God for the good of our kids, amen? All right, every night this week, we're gonna begin with awesome food. We're gonna move on to a welcome and introduction, some little business. Then we're gonna move into some worship and praise together that I hope will bring us together and call down the Holy Spirit into our midst. And then we're gonna bring our scholars up here to uh, bring the resources of their lives of study. I hope that you'll just take one more thing away. There might be somebody at home who, they just didn't, they just don't get on top of registrations. They didn't know they were gonna have a free night. They didn't fill anything out. 
Maybe that's you for Tuesday night or Thursday night this week. Here's the great thing about the space that the Dean of Yale Divinity School has given us. We got tons of space. We got tons of space, and we always order over order food. You guys didn't even eat half of what we brought out here tonight, which means if there's any other night this week that you see on this brochure and you said, I wish I'd signed up for that, just come. Just come, right? And if you have a friend at home that might have come, should have come, would have come, just didn't quite get it together or didn't know they were free, tell them to come. You can register online. That gives us a little head up, or you can just register at the desk. All right? So I want to bring up a, a couple of musicians and pastors who are going to begin tonight's worship for us, and we'll get this program started. Thank you for coming, and thank you for what you do. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonah, and this is Jenna. And we're both current students here at Yale Divinity School doing the Masters of Divinity degrees. Um, and we're going to lead some music tonight. So you all have song sheets on your tables. And we would love if you would sing along with us. We're going to start with Here I Am to Worship. And, yeah. song is God of Wonders. For those of you who know it, I think it's on the back. Is that how you do it? On the back, yeah. oh, all right.
Good evening. My name is Sarah Farmer, and I'm an associate research scholar here at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, and I am delighted to be here with you tonight. I just wanted to get a show of hands. How many of you came to last year's summer study? If you came last year, raise your hand. Okay, so we have a lot of people who are new this year. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I am delighted. I've been given the privilege to introduce our guest speakers for tonight. And I want to start with introducing Dr. Alan Hugh Cole, Jr., who is Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Director of Undergraduate Programs, and Professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. Prior to coming to the University of Texas, he served as Dean and the Nancy Taylor Williamson Distinguished Chair of Pastoral Care at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Austin, Texas, as well as a lecturer at Princeton Theological Seminary. Among Dr. Cole's current teaching and research interests are counseling interventions, spirituality, religion, and social work, mentoring, psychosocial development of boys and men, and disabilities. He has also written extensively in these areas. Just to name a few books, Cole is the author of The Life of Prayer, Mind, Body, and Soul, the author of Be Not Anxious, Pastoral Care of Disquieted Souls, the author of Good Morning, Getting Through Your Grief, and the author of Brief Counseling in Action, a Task-Centered Approach for Social Workers. He has also edited numerous volumes, including Theology and Service to the Church, Global and Ecumenical Perspectives, Fathers in Faith, Reflections on Parenthood in a Christian Life, and also A Spiritual Life, Perspectives from Poets, Prophets, and Preachers. Co-authored with Donald Capps and Robert Dykstra, he has written two books on teenage boys. Dr. Cole is also the author of various chapters, articles, and reviews and volumes and journals related to the fields of social work, counseling, and the psychology of religion. He serves on the editorial board for the Journal of Spirituality and Religion and Social Work, Social Thought. Responsible for leadership of the School of Social Work's Academic Affairs and a member of the Council on Leadership Development for the Council on Social Work Education, his work focuses on educating and supporting persons in social work, research, practice, teaching, and leadership. With him is Reverend Dr. Philip Browning Hessel, who is Assistant Professor of Pastoral Care and Counseling at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Previously, he served for four years at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. His current research interests include systemic pastoral care for oppression, migration as pastoral theology, collective trauma, and the care for families and kin networks, and pastoral care during a Trump presidency. He is the author of Pastoral Power, a book in the New Approaches to Religion and Power series, that is the first full-length book in pastoral care to examine the Great Recession's impact on mental health on communities of communities. Further, he is the author of numerous articles and book chapters and is on the editorial board for the Journal of Pastoral Care and Counseling. He's co-chair of the Intercultural and Interreligious Pastoral Theology Group at Society for Pastoral Theology. And so we are delighted to have both of these speakers. And one of the things I like to do is just say um, a personal uh, note about them. And just from meeting them um, today, both of them are very uh, just kind-hearted, along with brilliant, down-to-earth, and very knowledgeable about their area. So we're really blessed to have them here with us today. Would you join me in welcoming our speakers?
Well, thank you for that uh, extraordinarily generous introduction, Sarah. And uh, thanks to you and Skip and Susan, and I'm sure others of you who have made this event and many others like it possible and for taking such good care of us. Phil and I have remarked a number of times, both today and leading up to today, about the hospitality that you have extended to us. Uh, and we're, we're grateful for that, grateful for the opportunity to be in this esteemed place uh, with all of you experts. And uh, I just would want to say uh, amen to what Skip said earlier. I think we will have the opportunity to learn as much from you tonight as perhaps you will from us. And so uh, I say that to say I hope this will be a conversation that uh, begins tonight and that perhaps could be sustained over uh, a longer period of time. That would, that would be my hope. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you, more importantly, for what you do. Uh, I was a, a pastor for about seven years before I went full-time into the academic world. I have a, a deep appreciation for uh, who you are and what you do in your vocation as youth ministers. I have two kids, and uh, I have that angle of vision into that uh, ministry as well. And uh, uh, nothing is, is more valuable in my judgment than what, what you're doing. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And just one more comment, if I may, by, by way of introduction. Um, back in 2001, I had the privilege of meeting Phil Helsel, uh, who was a student in a class that I was teaching. I just finished my doctoral program and was teaching uh, a course called uh, Pastoral Care in the Life Cycle. And we, we struck up a friendship then that has really blossomed into a collegial relationship as well as a friendship. And uh, our theme tonight and, and other nights is... Uh, joy and the Christian life, and it's really a deep joy for me uh, to have the opportunity to stand as a colleague with Phil tonight and, and talk about something that's very important to both of us, both uh, personally and professionally. So, Phil, I wanted to make sure I said publicly how um, privileged I feel to be able to do this work with you. So, so we're going to talk about anxiety tonight, and uh, as Phil or Skip or someone remarked at lunch, there are often some jokes that go with that when you tell people you're going to talk about anxiety, like, uh, does that make you feel anxious or something like that? Um, but I don't have any jokes because um, I didn't think of any new material. But I, I think this is a, an experience that, that I hope you can relate to, if not personally, although some of you may relate to it personally. Um, certainly vocationally and in your work with, uh, with youth. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about what many people are calling an epidemic of anxiety among children and youth and provide some data that supports that view. Uh, and more important, talk about maybe some ways that we as mentors and as leaders in faith communities and in other communities perhaps that touch children's lives, how we might not only understand that phenomenon more deeply, but uh, more important, that how we might offer some, some resources to help support those, those young people in, in difficult times. So that'll be our uh, collective goal, and I look forward to, to being with you in that conversation. So I want to start out with some statistics. I do social science these days more than anything else, and I think statistics don't tell the whole story, but they're a good place uh, to start. And the statistics I'm going to quote come from um, a study that was done a number of years ago called the National Comorbidity, Comorbidity Study Replication, which was uh, funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And here are some things that we know from that uh, data. Approximately 19% of U.S. adults, or about 62.5 million people, um, had some kind of anxiety disorder, an experience that would meet the criteria of a, of a clinical di disorder in the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of the American Psychological Association, Psychiatric Association, or the DSM-5, um, 62.5 million people had an experience that would meet the criteria of having an anxiety disorder. Um, so that's a lot of people, uh, 19%. And it was higher for women than for men. That is a, a statistic that has remained pretty constant since we started tracking these things. It doesn't mean that women are more anxious. It means that women are more apt to report that experience than men and certainly more apt to seek help for that experience than men. But we think men are, are just as anxious as women. Um, they just don't uh, report it or seek uh, help for it as, as often. So a lot of adults have anxiety. Some estimates say that over the course of their lifetime, 
at least a quarter of adults, if not higher, uh, will experience anxiety um, that's significant enough to meet the criteria for a psychiatric disorder, quote unquote. So it's significant for a lot of people. Um, this data says that 31% of US adults, or about 102 million people in the current population, will have such an anxiety disorder in their lives. And the other thing we know is that these data are probably a little conservative for the reasons I mentioned, that people are not uh, prone to report these experiences as widely as maybe they could and we would like them to, uh, or to seek treatment for them. We also know that anxiety um, impairs people, and there's some data on that. Among adults with an anxiety disorder in the past year from this study, about 22% had serious impairment, so almost a quarter of those people. And then 33, almost 34% had moderate impairment. So if you combine those, about 56% of adults who experience anxiety have at least moderate, if not severe, impairment. So it's impacting people's lives in ways that are, uh, are problematic, to say the least. And then about 43%, 43.5% experience what they call mild impairment. And again, these data don't capture the people who are living with anxiety, but who, not, who may not meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder. And there are lots of those folks out there uh, as well. So that's, that's the data on adults. What do we know about adolescents? Well, in looking at a, a snapshot of, of kids aged 13 to 18, and that's the demographic that, that we'll use tonight to define adolescents, there's some disagreement on, on this developmental period, but I think this captures sort of the, um, the sort of central demographic that most people work with. Look at those data. About 32% have had or have an anxiety disorder. Um, they report less severity than adults do. There are some theories about why that's the case, um, including they haven't been anxious long enough or to, to report it as severe. Um, again, uh, girls a little uh, more prominent according to the data than in boys. Um, and it's similar across age groups, although we know the median age for children in anxiety is about 11 years old, which means about half the children who have anxiety disorders or struggle severely with anxiety will be under 11 years old, and about half will be um, over 11 up to age 18. And so it starts very young. And again, we know that usually by the time a child is brought um, to some sort of intervention or treatment for anxiety, he or she has been struggling with it for a significant period of time, usually uh, several years. So what does anxiety do to adolescents? Well, we know that it contributes to uh, lower self-esteem. Adolescents can struggle with self-esteem anyway, but to have uh, a significant experience with anxiety, we know that that correlates oftentimes with lower self-esteem. Uh, it can correlate, too, with behavioral problems or what we sometimes call acting out. In fact, we know that a lot of kids who have difficulty in school and peer relationships and in family relationships, um, we can trace those difficulties, in many cases, to anxiety experiences. So anxiety can make kids more oppositional. It can make kids um, less on task, less able to follow directions. And they seem defiant but there's something else going on in a lot of these cases, and it's anxiety. Uh, we know that kids who are anxious tend to underperform more often in school and even drop out of school. There's some pretty hard data on that. Also, uh, kids who commit crimes, a significant number of those kids will report uh, anxiety experiences. Teenage pregnancy correlates with, with anxiety. We know that. Social isolation does as well. One of the things we know about anxiety across uh, the life cycle is that it's an isolating experience. Um, people have, uh, they're embarrassed oftentimes to be anxious, and so what they try to do is they hide their anxiety, which tends to exacerbate the symptoms and makes them more anxious. The more you try to hide it, the more anxious you feel and therefore typically present. So um, what many people do as a result is they isolate themselves from people around them, and they suffer in silence. Um, you may know some kids like this. You may know others. Maybe you yourself have had this experience. It's, it, it often correlates with social isolation. And then we know that anxious kids are more likely to use or abuse alcohol and or drugs as a way of self-medicating, of taking the edge of the anxiety away perhaps, escaping the pain that comes with anxiety. All the reasons that, that people self-medicate 
uh, with drugs and alcohol apply to uh, anxiety experiences as well. Here are some additional facts that uh, anxiety co-occurs with some other mental health struggles or disorders. Things like depression. We know that anxiety and depression are often two sides of the same coin. If you have an anxious person, you'll often have a depressed person as well and vice versa. Clinicians sometimes speak in terms of anxiety sitting on top of depression, so that anxiety is the presenting problem, quote unquote, but it, it sort of sits on top of a more uh, pervasive underlying uh, depression. So if you're working with a kid who seems anxious, um, keep in mind that that kid could also be depressed. Eating disorders also uh, co-occur with anxiety disorders, uh, as do substance use disorders, and ADHD. We know that, that more and more kids are being diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, and uh, of those kids, we know that many of them will also present with symptoms that are kind of classic uh, anxiety uh, diagnoses as well. So one doesn't cause the other, but they often uh, come together, they correlate, and that's important to know. We also know that about 8 to 10 percent, and this again is probably conservative, of school absenteeism can be linked uh, to anxiety experiences. So anxious kids are less likely to want to go to school regularly. If they don't go to school, they get behind, they underperform, they get anxious about that, about catching up. Uh, which exacerbates their uh, desire not to, to be at school, but rather to be at home, social isolation again. So anxiety is not sort of simply a problem in and of itself. It causes or, or correlates with many other significant problems for children and adolescents. And many people are more and more using the term uh, rising epidemic to talk about uh, anxiety as a phenomenon in, in a North American context in particular, but but also in other parts uh, of the world as well. So what does anxiety look like and feel like? Um, how do you know what to look for or to be aware of when you're, when you're talking with youth that you're working with or you're in their presence? I, I've got a laundry list of things. I'm not going to go into an in-depth discussion of all of them, uh, but I want to touch them, and you can make note of them, and if you have questions about them, we can come back to them later in the uh, presentation. We will have a a time for Q&A at the end uh, if you want to ask questions about any of this. So here are some of the things we know. Um, anxious people, anxious kids, in this case adolescents, may present as, as being overzealous to please people, and especially older kids or mentors or adults like teachers or coaches, uh, parents too. Um, they can display an earnestness to complete tasks that disregards an appropriate process. So the kid that's kind of always raising her hand or his hand or sort of interrupting the process or the conversation or running to the front of the line to pick me, pick me, uh, that can, can be, doesn't have to be, but it can be um, something that correlates with anxiety. Uh, perfectionism. Anxious people are often perfectionists. Things have to be sort of perfect, right, or they feel... Um, uh, less well about themselves or their contributions to the group or whatever uh, they might be a part of. Um, there can also be a propensity for assigning blame or responsibility to others, blaming others when a desired result is not forthcoming. So if you had only done this for this project, it would have been better. It's your fault. Uh, if you'd gotten that hit, we would have won the game, that kind of thing. Uh, there can be a fixation on a particular task or event or project or concern, uh, even to a point of, of an obsession or a compulsion. And so we know that anxiety disorders also often correlate with obsessive compulsive kinds of behaviors, fixations, uh, an inability to let things go, if you will, hyperperfectionism. All of that correlates with um, OCD as well as anxiety. Uh, hypercritical responses to relatively insignificant matters, making a mountain out of a molehill, if you will. Uh, any of this sound familiar to any of you? I see some heads nodding, okay. <laughs> Personally or otherwise. Uh. And then aggressive attitudes toward others, and particularly when they're criticized. So uh, if you know adolescents or anybody who seems kind of highly defended or defensive, they sort of react to things that you think are not such a big deal, that can be something that correlates with uh, what we're talking about. Uh, intolerance for receiving appropriate critical feedback or criticism, which again is often received as a personal affront. 
Uh, nervous speech or behavior, we sometimes talk about pressured speech for people who are highly anxious, so it's hard for them to, to sort of keep a, um, sort of a typical cadence in their speech, so they'll either speak real quickly or sort of in disjointed kinds of ways, um, particularly in more public settings. Again, addictive or compulsive behaviors that can relate to substance misuse, gambling, eating disorders, or hypersexuality. See this a lot in, in adolescents who are uh, precocious sexually. There can oftentimes be an anxiety component that's, that's a part of that, so be aware uh, of that phenomenon too. Um, and then again, avoidance of others or isolating oneself from others. Poor listening, um, abrupt or unpredictable pace and tone in conversation, I mentioned that. A lack of attention or focus, an inability to stay on task. Again, this correlates with the attentional deficit disorder that we're talking about. Uh, chronic worry, this is a big one. What if this happens? What if that happens? Uh, kind of always worried about things that they may or may not have control over. I'm going to say more about the relationship between worry and anxiety here in a few minutes. But, but flag that. And then kind of a more general negative view of life, more pessimistic, less hopeful. Uh, Debbie Downer, if you're familiar with that Saturday Night Live skit uh, of a, years, a few years ago. Um, some catastrophe is right around the corner. It's kind of the Woody Allen effect, some people say. Something always bad is about to happen. That can be uh, something that's a marker for anxiety. Um, highly resistant to change. Um, anxious people like things to stay the way they are because they figured out how to negotiate their lives that way. And so if you change any of that, um, it, it's, it's jarring, it's disruptive, and that tends to make their anxiety levels rise. Um, if you work in congregations, you probably see this on a macro level too. I mean, think of a time when you know, a worship committee or a pastor or some committee has made some significant change. What happens in the system? The, Anxiety goes through the roof and people start fighting with each other and doing things that are uncharacteristic of them and the Christian life perhaps. Maybe that's just the churches I've been in, but um, I've heard that happens. Um, that's anxiety, right? Anxiety in the system that relates to, uh, to change and messing up the homeostasis of, of the anxious person's uh, life and experience. Um, conflicted relationships, familial, peer relationships, teacher-student relationships, Sometimes a lack of trust that leads to a more generalized suspiciousness of motives and actions, and feeling as if life is unstable, unpredictable, or that they themselves are misunderstood. So now there are physical qualities, too, I want to talk about. You may know some of these, uh, maybe most of them. Feeling on edge, like you're just sort of on edge most of the time, not being able to sleep, which can involve rumination about concerns that you have, hypervigilance with respect to planning for and anticipating outcomes, so overthinking things at night maybe in particular and not being able to sleep, a nervous stomach maybe to the point of nausea, tightness in the chest. So anxiety is very visceral, it's a very physical experience, it's not just an emotional or psychological or relational experience, it can be very physical uh, in its presentation. Uh, increased heart rate and breathing patterns, especially shortness of breath, Hot or cold flashes, uh, clamminess, chills, sweatiness, dizziness, feeling faint, clenching teeth, especially at night. If you know someone who clenches their teeth at night or grinds their teeth, that can be uh, correlating with anxiety. Shaking their legs or their feet. You ever see kids at a desk or at a, in a chair that are shaking their legs or feet or adults? That can be a way to display some of that uh, feeling of anxiety. Um, and some of these I've touched on already. Vulnerability, anxiety causes people to feel highly vulnerable, um, at risk, um, as if they might um, lose their mind or be seen as having lost their mind, which again can lead to isolation, loneliness, pessimistic outlooks about the future, uh, et cetera. I want to touch this a little longer um, because it, it's so key to the developmental period of adolescence, and that is um, anxiety can impact one's understanding of his or herself or identity. We know that the kids during the, the adolescence period are trying to figure out who they are. That's sort of their, their first sort of major leap into that sort of uh, internal and external work of discovering who they are, who they want to be. 
They'll often try on some different identities, right? So they start dressing in different ways, and they listen to different kinds of music, and they hang out with different peer groups, and they have different interests. We know that developmentally that's appropriate, and they should be supported in that. Um, they're trying on different ways of being themselves. Well, we know that anxiety can, can get in the way of that. It can short circuit that developmentally appropriate period in their lives uh, by making it much more conflicted than it, than it needs to be. Um, so that they start uh, worrying about disappointing other people, parents, teachers, peers, in ways that many adolescents seem not to worry so much about, and that's a good thing. Uh, a lack of clarity, uh, perhaps, about where their anxiety is coming from and, and how it defines them in their own minds as a person. Um, they can feel emotional and physical fatigue, have erratic behavior, and again, feel as if uh, they're going crazy or, or losing their mind. Well, this isn't a new thing. Um, we're talking about it in some different ways now. We have uh, modern science and medicine and, and psychology and theology to help us talk about it in some ways that we've never talked about before. But it goes way back to the ancients, and the biblical writers were well aware of this, and they captured it in a lot of places in the Bible. So I want to uh, hold up to you a, a few places in Scripture where the authors are talking about anxiety and see what you sort of think about this. The, the Apostle Paul, who has been accused of a lot of things, being anxious being one of them, um, writes in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, there is a daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. So this is, um, in, the, in the RSV, the word chosen is anxiety from the Greek. Uh, so he's anxious about the churches, and when discussing the Christian's present affliction, quote-unquote, and future glory, he notes, while we are still in this tent, we sigh with anxiety, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, I'll defer to those of you who are smarter than I am to, to know what that means, but I know it has something to do with anxiety, and that's the reason I'm, I'm lifting it up for you tonight. It's, anxiety is in kind of a central place in this, uh, in this passage that, that Paul is offering. In, what's that? Losing heart and losing faith, yes. In Philippians, he urges, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Maybe a more familiar passage that you hear quoted a lot in churches, but anxiety is the impetus for him um, writing about this, right? And then the author of 1 Peter implores his audience to, quote, cast all your anxiety on God because God here, uh, cares for you. And then Jesus has some things to say about anxiety as well. He says, do not be anxious about your life. And he asks, which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his or her span of life? And then he urges, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. I, I guess that's supposed to be helpful, right? Don't be anxious today <laughs> because it's going to be that way tomorrow. Um, but he's talking about anxiety. He's lifting it up as, as something to consider. And then he adds, which is helpful, fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure uh, to give you the kingdom. And so Jesus is saying, fear not, be not anxious, um, trust in God's provision. So I'm going to ask Phil to come up and, and talk about adolescent development, and then we'll hand it off again a couple of times. So, so that's anxiety in about, what, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. So. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for the warm introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being so hospitable. Uh, hospitality has been the hallmark of this experience. Um, and it's with joy that I come and thank you for your ministry as well. Um, and I hope you just get a big chance to take a deep breath right now. Uh, I can't imagine the daily pressures that are on you as you're working. And if <clears throat> my memory serves me well, the kind of work you do doesn't provide a lot of money or support or even glory necessarily. Um, but I, I want to say thank you for doing it. <laughs> there is glory if you're watching for it, right? So I'd like to talk in this section today about um, adolescent development 
and uh, make some links between uh, what Alan was saying about anxiety specifically. So in addition to the kinds of anxiety that Alan was talking about, there are, there are things like uh, school phobia and social phobia. And I just, um, and those are frequent in kids. And so I want you to pay attention to the ways that anxiety as an experience kind of piggybacks on adolescent development in general. Or how does it play into adolescence and what they're going through as they're changing? So the biological, psychological, and social changes in adolescence defined here between 13 and 19 years of age. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about joy in here as well. Give you a taste of what I think that means. Biologically, the brains of teens are quite plastic. Gray matter peaks in teenage brains at 13 in boys and at 12 in girls, and then it's pruned back based on what they don't use. So everything gets put in there right away, 12 and 13, and then that's why those early, early adolescent years are so important, because what you don't use, you lose. So whatever pathways don't get used, then are lost. So that's why there's kind of all this uh, cultivation, um, yeah, I, I won't say too much more about that right now. Um, but you can imagine what that might mean for those early teen years. So uh, the prefrontal cortex that controls decision making is poorly developed in adolescence. This might not be a surprise for you. Uh, meaning they're less capable than adults of taking into account the perspectives of others. And they've developed tests to prove this. Um, they just don't have the ability to see what others might be thinking or feeling. So just take that into account as you're working, especially with young adolescents, 13, 14, something like that. Teen brains seem primed for pleasure, with peer acceptance lighting up the same areas of the brain as sexual pleasure. So getting, getting your peers to approve of you is a supercharge for the teenage brain, and it goes straight down to the reptilian fight-or-flight part of the brain. Um, it's just the most exciting thing you could have. Um, there are certain uh, themes that come up frequently. Oh, by the way, the body of an adolescent between 13 and 18 puts on 50% more matter. So just, uh, it's a tremendous amount of growth and a season uh, and a window of opportunity. Um, so they say that what happens in adolescence can be really predictive of later adult health outcomes. Adolescence is an important time to intervene with kids, to get them healthy, um, to give them opportunities um, and choices and cultivate them. So the, the, the um, oh yeah, key themes of adolescence. What do adolescents frequently say? Uh, why is everyone looking at me? So there's something that happens in the adolescent brain in middle school uh, and after a little bit that makes them feel like people are paying more attention to them than they actually are. Uh, there's a perceptual distortion that happens and they think, oh, people are watching me. Well, they might be, but t kids seem, seem to feel this uh, to a greater extent than is actually true. Uh, so many kids feel self-conscious, even teens that don't have anxiety problems. Maybe teens with anxiety more so. Um, another thing that ki kids often say is, I'm taking up the cause. And that might happen later in adolescence, around high school. That's an important thing to know and join as well. Uh, so whatever it was for you, uh, or for me, or for the kids in your care, for me as a kid, it was the death penalty. And I was going around protesting the death penalty when I was uh, 16, 17, and 18. And I was taking up the cause. And you might have had something like that as well. What are, you, what are your teens uh, doing advocating for social justice? There's one more thing I want to mention that teens have that I didn't get on this slide, and that's a personal fable. That's a sense that they have been through something that no one else can relate to. So teens have a personal fable. They've been through something that no one else can relate to. And just being aware of that as a youth pastor seems really important. So you say something like, even though you've heard it 25,000 times from other kids, you say something like, that sounds really distinctive to you. Or what is that like for you? Um, this, this is unique. Uh, tell me your story about this. Um, they want you to know that they've been through something distinctive that nobody else can relate to. That's a personal fable. So um, teens seem primed for joy, and that has something to do with adolescent development. Um, 
teens seem able to transcend themselves, uh, to transcend everything around them, everything that, that people thought was possible or not possible for that particular kid, and kind of sometimes receive the gift of the self from the future. I had no idea I would be like this. I had no idea this self of me was coming. So they kind of, teenagers enjoy, meet themselves coming and going. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's my initial definition of joy for this talk. Who am I really? The developmental theorist Eric Erickson defined identity as a consistent enough sense of self as unique individual in terms of roles, attitudes, beliefs, and aspirations. Consistent enough, okay? Um, so teenagers, as Alan mentioned, are always trying out multiple selves, roles. Um, new, new styles of tennis shoes, haircut, may help kids figure out who they are. The ability to feel safe trying out a new identity in the teenage years is, is rooted in attachment, how well they connected to people early in life. They say zero to five is really important for that. So the ability to rebel is actually rooted in a safe space, a, chance, a place of trust. If you have a place of trust, then you can do your own thing. Whatever people think, I'm going to rebel, whatever my community thinks. That's the result of being cared for. That's paradoxical in some ways, isn't it? Or maybe not. So adolescents who feel supported enough in who they are might actually rebel more, stressing and demanding from parents. Um, and likewise, adolescents who lack dependable caregivers when they were young, doesn't have to be parents, but just some kind of caregiver, um, might become anxious and clingy when it comes time to give up the old and enter a new part of life. Um, another thing I'll mention here is the inevitable losses that come in adolescence from a life cycle perspective. Teenagers are often losing grandparents as well and losing uh, ancestors, older members of the family. Um, and so that's an important um, loss that uh, kids will have to sort out um, as well in their family system. So adolescence is a time of trying out new identities in preparation for the task of leaving home. And again, attachment, that first five years of life seems to be really important in how adolescents can launch. Oh, I had a slide about that too. You could have been looking at this great slide the whole time. Yeah, we gotta give that a moment, right? Yeah. Those things make you feel good. <laughs> Stages of faith. Let me do this kind of quickly. Um, how do adolescents who are changing rapidly in their minds, emotions, and bodies interact with their faith differently? Um, James Fowler's Stages of Faith, you all familiar? Everybody kind of familiar with that? Um, gives a series of steps where you move from kind of a mythic, li very literal faith uh, that uses the stories. So this is some of the changes that might happen in your teens. They might move from a literalistic telling of stories to more um, conventional faith. What are the kids around me thinking and believing? What's my community thinking? And then by the end of high school or something like that, they might be thinking, um, who am I when I'm not in this community? And how do I know that the story is true? So that's what we have to be preparing kids for, is that change that happens when they say, who am I when I'm not in this community? And how do I know that the story is true? So the ability to reflect on faith and the stages of faith that kids go through are based on the changes that are happening in kids' brains, bodies, and minds. Their adolescent development prepares them to go through the stages of faith change, changes that occur. Um, so you got to give kids space to do these stages of faith changes, but not rush them, right? So it could go either way. You could bring your stage of faith and like kind of impose it on them, tell them you don't necessarily believe in heaven and hell, and then they're like not there yet, right? And there's a mismatch. If you share your doubts a little too early. On the other hand, if you never share your doubts, if you never share your own stages of faith transformation, kids might not have a chance to see what that looks like. They want to accompany you in that journey. And that's based on adolescent development, changes that happen in the, the body, brain, and society that kids um, are going through. 
So joyful teen flourishing means taking account of kids' questions, um, but not rushing into them, if that makes any sense. I hope it does. Uh, what role does racial identity development play in, in adolescent development? Um, this is Amanda Stenberg, and she's in a new movie now called The Hate You Give, uh, which is a beautiful book by Angie Thomas. I encourage it for everyone, um, which is an African-American girl's journey through uh, adolescent development in the context of a lot of social trauma that's happening around her. So she doesn't get a chance to just go peacefully through stages on every corner, at every part of her life, she's confronted with life or death decisions. She's confronted with oppression that challenges her very being. And uh, she has to make decisions about how to respond to that oppression. So that's what, um, that's what adolescent development looks like for some. Uh, the Christian educator Patrick Reyes said that adolescent development in his community growing up meant simply surviving to adulthood. Um, he said that in his book, Nobody Cries When We Die, um, uh, a book I strongly recommend that I taught this year at Austin Seminary. So what role does racial identity play in adolescent development? Um, I think one of the things that's really crucial is for teens to have respect for others and respect from others. So teens need to feel respect for others, uh, a positive ability to reach out across racial difference, and they need to feel respect from others. And they have a super attuned antenna for when they don't have that, right? Uh, it's just uh, very clear that that's the case. Um, for LGBTQ teens, finding a safe place such as a queer straight alliance can help foster pride in the, in the process of growing up. Um, one of the books I really like for counseling uh, LGBTQ youth is called Nurturing Queer Youth by Stonefish and Harvey. So that's one I'll recommend to you now. Um, when I was growing up in my youth group, we had an integrated youth group. Um, and uh, a lot of, it was a predominantly white congregation in a mostly African American community. And we just started inviting people from the community to come into the church um, and going around on youth group night and just kind of with the big van and inviting everyone to come. And uh, from that experience, I realized uh, just how many of my peers, African-American teens in that town were experiencing deep disrespect and social prejudice um, and exclusion. Um, but this church, the church really helped connect, I think, as well. And one of the things that happened, um, one of the teens in, in our youth group one of my peers had a mother in prison, a father who was absent, and a stepfather who was demanding but engaged. Um, and he got into Taekwondo at the church. And there was a youth pastor who just gave out free Taekwondo lessons. And it was like tremendously powerful, the bro uh, breaking blocks and hayaing and all of that stuff. Like, I don't know what it was, but it just seemed to send him on the right kind of path. Um, so it seems like we live in a very divided society um, teenagers, so we're switching now from race to class. Uh, teenagers in the United States, 20% uh, live in abject poverty. Um, and in his book, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, Robert Putnam talks about two styles of parenting, two Americas, essentially, two school systems, uh, where people have disparate access and totally different kinds of parenting and uh, flourishing opportunities. And what happens a lot of times in poorer communities is that kids face adverse childhood experiences more often. Um, I've got a list of them here. They're things like uh, being humiliated or threatened physically, being hit, slapped or injured, uh, sexually abused, uh, parents separated, divorced, lack food or clothing when parents were too drunk or high to care for you. Um, Robert Putnam gives this list of ACEs and he says something like, if kids have a lot of these adverse childhood experiences, it's amazing that they survive. So when you get a kid who has six or seven, they're like a walking miracle, you know what I mean? They're, they're real survivors, and you kind of, then the process is attend to what helped them survive, uh, attend how to strengthen them in, in what they're going through. Um, and Putnam also says that those ACEs are just another way of talking about poverty and its impacts on people. 
Um, so this is what poverty does uh, to people, um, putting them in these situations. Um, in the middle of these uh, difficult dynamics, there's amazing chances of resilience and flourishing. And one of them I, I found in a film recently called Los Graduatos, or The Graduates, uh, directed by Bernardo Ruiz. And uh, 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 it was put out on independent lens. I highly encourage you to watch it. Um, one of the stories that's talked about, it's all about uh, different, differential access to education in Latinx communities and how we can encourage Latinx youth to stay in school. And uh, this uh, young woman, Chastity Salas, is depicted, and she's homeless during a lot of the movie, the filming of the movie. And um, she's also writing poetry about her experiences. And it's the most beautiful poetry that you'll ever hear. She shares some of it in the film. And by the end of the film, she has mentors and college guidance counselors who come alongside of her and help her imagine college, which is really hard for her because she feels like she needs to stick around and take care of her family. Um, and uh, she ends up ex being accepted to Sarah Lawrence College. So what is authentic joy in adolescence? Authentic joy matches with the possibilities of a particular life. Um, C.S. Lewis once described joy as the calling card of the Christian life. And um, joy is inherently present at, as adolescents um, leave childhood and enter young adulthood, as they move out from friends to society, finding purpose along the way. Um, many teens need a break from self-consciousness for a time in order to find joy. One biracial teenage girl whose mother had died, her mother was Puerto Rican, was rebelling and she was put into uh, psychological treatment, into counseling. Her journey of wholeness involved reintegrating her cultural background, her Puerto Rican side, and reclaiming the vitality that came from it. Sometimes joy requires doing something different with one's life, questioning the norms and visions of one's community. But joy is relational, and it should be discovered in community with parents and other mentors. So I'd like to foster kind of joy-filled conversations with kids and their parents, where kids get a chance to interview parents about their own adolescence. What would that look like? Here's some questions that you might want to foster. If you could get kids and parents to talk to one another and do like a mock interview session. What were you like in high school? This stuff is fascinating. <laughs> Tell me about a fork in the road in your life. Who inspired you the most? So I'm picturing kids interviewing their parents about this. What advice would you give to your 16-year-old self or 15-year-old self or 14-year-old self? Whatever you have. Um, so I picture, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there and uh, Hand, the, hand this back to, to Alan, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, I mentioned on, in the outset that I wanted to distinguish anxiety from worry and some other kinds of experiences, so I wanna spend a little bit of time on that. Um, I would submit that anxiety is not the same thing as fear or worry, although folks who are anxious will oftentimes say that they're fearful and worried. But I think to say that worry, for example, exhausts what it means to feel anxious is sort of like saying that um, sexuality exhausts what it means to be in love or something like that. It's a, it's, it could be a component of anxiety, but it's not an exhaustive understanding of anxiety and fear. I would say the same thing about that. Um, anxiety is, is more something like um, dread or angst. That's the classical word, angst, uh, that involves a kind of inner strife and disharmony. So things just are off within oneself, if you will. It's not as if something out there is wrong, that we're afraid of something out there, but it's something is amiss inside of us and, and who we understand ourselves to be and what we understand our place in the world uh, to be. Which is to say that anxiety has less to do with what we can encounter or what may happen to us. That's more like fear. Um, it has more to do with who we are and to whom we belong, right? And so I can, 
I can be afraid of snakes or heights or, uh, you know, dancing in public or something like that. But, but that's an externalized object of fear that I can name, right? And anxiety is, is not like that. It's more elusive. It's more sort of what we call free-floating. It kind of floats around to different kinds of experiences. Um, and for our purposes tonight, I want to spend the majority of the rest of my, my time in this segment. Um, for our purposes tonight, I want to think in terms of anxiety as a spiritual condition. I remarked about this in an interview we did uh, with Skip and Sarah this morning that I taught in a seminary for a lot of years, and for the last four years I've taught in a, in a school of social work at a state university, public uh, university. And I teach classes that, that have uh, anxiety as a part of them. So I teach uh, social workers, future social workers, and current social workers uh, some different ways of thinking about anxiety and working with anxious people. And one of the things that surprised me is even in that setting, which is uh, not a religious setting at all, many people, maybe the majority of people who will identify their own personal experiences with anxiety and or experiences of, of clients or people they've worked with who are anxious, um, will, will be able to name sort of this, these spiritual overtones to that experience. And so they, they, they wouldn't perhaps um, uh, think about it in terms of kind of a formally religious kind of thing, but it, it's spiritual in the sense um, that I will describe here in, in the next few minutes. So I think it's helpful to think about anxiety as a spiritual condition by focusing on, on four concerns that I want to name and unpack a little bit for you tonight. Um, the first one is what I call theocentric concerns, or that's a fancy way of saying sort of God-centered concerns. And concerns that, that, that uh, play themselves out this way have to do with if you will, God's nature or character, who God is for the anxious person, and therefore how he or she views God acting or behaving in the world. And so there's some sort of anxiety about who God is, whether God is, does God exist, what is the character of that God, um, how do I know. Um, the theocentric concern is one that's often central to uh, anxiety experiences. And, and I think this is particularly true for people who are in religious communities, that, that they are in religious communities oftentimes, if they're anxious, looking for some sort of way to uh, manage that, to ameliorate that, to try to get through that experience in more uh, helpful and life-giving ways. The second concern is what I call the theorelational, which is another way of saying um, what is one's personal relationship with God. So if one set of questions has to do with who God is, God's nature, God's character, is God involved in the world, this concern has to do with is God involved in my life or do, do I matter to God or um, does what I do matter, does who I am matter, um, what does God think of us and, and what uh, stance does God take in relationship to us. That's the theorelational concern. Then there are what I call vocational concerns, and youth, I think in particular, we alluded to this already, are really struggling with these kinds of concerns oftentimes. Um, who has God created and called me to be? Uh, what am I supposed to do with my life? Who am I? What is my purpose? Uh, what has meaning for me? What do I value? What kind of person do I want to be? Those are, are really live questions that begin to come to the fore in adolescence. They don't end there. Many of us are still... Uh, asking those questions, and I think that's a good thing. But it really begins uh, to be more predominant in adolescence. And then what I call the mortal concerns, and those have to do with three principal matters, things like life after death, uh, how much of life is yet to be lived before I die, and whether life has been or will be meaningful, faithful, and true. So adolescence is, is often the first time when we sort of begin to think about mortality, right? I mean, young people, the cliche, which is true, don't think a lot about their own mortality. And, and many people anecdotally will say, well, adolescents and young adults don't think much about that either. But if you talk to youth and, and you look at the data, the youth do start thinking about issues of mortality uh, as they're trying on these different ways of being in the world in adolescence. And so I think it's really important for, for folks who work with youth to be aware of that and, and to sort of listen under the surface, if you will, for these kinds of, of concerns. 
Um, the other thing that I want to make sure I touch about adolescence is that, and Phil mentioned this in his uh, piece a few minutes ago, authenticity really matters to youth. It's really a time in their developmental life where um, they care more about what's true and real and authentic than ever before. Um, and maybe you have some experiences of that. And so they really begin to be able to sniff out fakes and people who are inauthentic and who say one thing and do another, which has all kinds of, of, of implications, one of which is that the way adults who interact with youth carry themselves is really more important than what they say, right? What we model for kids with respect to any of these concerns, for example, matters more than what we ultimately uh, say about them. So I think you know this, but I think if you're like me, it's good to be reminded of, of what can be at stake in that. So I want to talk a little bit about mentoring as a sort of way into the practice of, of thinking about anxiety as a spiritual condition, and more important, to working with anxious adolescents around their experiences in faith communities. Mentoring seems to be um, a tried and true way of, of sort of entering into that relational kind of experience in ways that can be uh, helpful and, and edifying for, for the mentor as well as the mentee. So you may be familiar with, with language about Christian practices. This is language that's been used a lot in the last decade or so around conversations like this. And, and, and I want to sort of define uh, what I mean by, by practices. And, and that is, and Phil and I agree on this definition, so I asked him if I could put it in my slide. Um, so practices are the kinds of things that we do, and, and that's really important. They're, they're action-oriented. They, they involve agency as, a, as opposed to primarily involving cognition. It's not so much what we think, but it's what we do, how we enact uh, what we think, if you will, that create new ways of seeing and knowing and being in the world. And so there are lots of ways of understanding this philosophically, psychologically, um, um, otherwise, but, but really what it means is what we do matters maybe more than what we say we think or believe, that we, how we act shapes the way we see the world, the way we identify ourselves of being in that world, what we value, uh, what we invest in, those kinds of things. So practices are really significant, and, they're, and they're, they're tried and true in the Christian tradition. I mean, Christianity began, many would argue, um, not with a systematic theology, but with a set of practices that got sort of formalized over time, right? The, the earliest Christian theologies were folks following this guy Jesus around and, and learning from him, right? So practice is really important concept. And then for our purposes, I want to define spirituality um, as follows. It's a process of human life and development. And process is underlined to, to, to show that it's not a static thing. You don't sort of once and for all have your spirituality, right? But it's a, it's a more fluid kind of experience, again, that relates to this concept of practice. It evolves over time. Maybe it ebbs and flows over time. It takes on different shapes and contours. It's a process of human life and development that focuses on the search for such things as meaning, purpose, morality, and well-being. So sort of deep-seated values of being a human being in relationship to oneself, other people, other beings in the universe, ultimate reality, however those are understood. So this is a general sort of broad a uh, generous kind of understanding of spirituality. The Christian traditions have their particular ways of understanding spirituality, as do all the world's religions. Um, but I want to be broad here and not limiting in, in our understanding of spirituality. And then it orients around centrally significant priorities or values that we commit to certain things that we care about and orient our lives around and give to and support uh, and champion, those kinds of things. And it inevitably engages a sense of the transcendent. That's really important. Something that's experienced as deeply profound, sacred, or transpersonal. So with that in mind, I want to think about what it means to be a mentor um, in a faith community working with youth who may have these anxiety experiences. So what does it mean to be a mentor? Well, my definition is as follows. It, it entails intentional social interaction. So it's not something that happens passively, but it's intentional. Mentors are seeking a particular kind of relationship. Maybe mentees are as well. 
with non-parental adults. So this is really important. You can't mentor your child. I mean, you can be a parent to your child and you can embrace some of the qualities that mentors would ideally embrace, but I'm saying it, it, it's different being a mentor than it is being a parent, right? I think that's really important. And, and if, you, if you are a parent, you've talked to parents, you'll know that your kids can talk to other adults in ways that they may find it difficult to talk to you as their parent. And you're grateful for those, if you're like me, grateful for those uh, mentors in their lives. But non-parental adults or older peers who don't have advanced professional training and mentoring, so they're not professional mentors, they're just important people in a kid's life, um, who provide guidance and other forms of support that is intended to benefit one or more areas of their development as a youth, and fosters ongoing significant interpersonal ties around particular kinds of activity. So mentoring is, is, is at its best, in my experience and in my opinion, something that centers on, again, doing things, being in a relationship that's consistent around doing things, ideally that, that the mentee is driving, that the things he or she is interested in or wanting to explore um, are, are, are called to the fore. So if you buy all of that, um, I want to give you some takeaways that, that, that I hope you can find opportunities to incorporate in your own work. And they come from this concept called positive youth development. Anybody ever heard of positive youth development? OK, good. I can maybe teach you something uh, tonight. Um, positive youth development is still a, a pretty new sort of way of thinking about uh, youth development and mentoring. But it, Significant is that it really focuses on strengths as opposed to deficits. So it sees um, kids, mentees, as having inherent value and inherent strength and starting there uh, as a way to organize the relationship as opposed to trying to fill some gap or to try to counter some deficit or um, assuage some pathology or something like that. It's strengths-based. It starts with uh, recognizing inherent value and strength in a human being, every human being, and really trying to exploit that in the mentoring relationship. Positive youth development. There are six C's that I want to mention uh, that, that make up this way of, of looking at positive youth development. Um, we want to promote a sense of competence. What's competence mean to you? What does it mean? Somebody tell me. If you're competent, what does that mean? Pardon? Capable? Proficient? What else? Faith in yourself, good. Have a sense of your own competence, okay? So we want to um, promote a sense of competence. Confidence, what is that? Assurance. Assurance, trust in oneself, trust in others. Not afraid. Not afraid, okay, good. Connection, what's connection mean? Pardon? Interpersonal. Relational, mutual, or mutuality in relationship. Good. Cohesiveness, feeling cohesiveness within the group. Anything else? Connection? Pardon? Unifying. Unifying, okay. If we say we're connected, we're unified, we're joined together, etc. Character, what does that mean? Integrity. What else? Authenticity, we talked about that. That often goes uh, transparency, care, core values, how one shapes his or her life and being in the world. Caring, what's caring mean? Actions. Maybe empathy, being able to feel with other people, being empathic. What else? Compassionate. You know what compassion means literally? Suffering with, com, passio, uh, co-suffering or suffering with. Um, and then contribution, what does that mean to you? To give something, right? To contribute, to, to give from oneself and one's talents or one's experiences. Okay, so I'm going to unpack these a bit more and ask you to help me. What's that? Yes, giving, giving for the sake of giving, right, as opposed to wanting something in return. Good. So in order to promote competence, these are some suggestions that you might think about and incorporate in your own work. 
This isn't an exhaustive list. You'll come up with better ideas probably than I will, but hopefully this gets you thinking about it. So find things that your mentee likes and support these passions and activities without taking over. What does that mean? That last part's really important. Yeah. So if your youth likes to shoot basketball, probably don't go out and make sure you, you beat him or her at basketball every time you, you play. Oh, I play basketball in high school. I'm glad you like this game. Let me show you my work here, you know. Not that, but be, let the youth lead in that and, and sort of hold back if, if that's required. Being a coach. Being a coach. <clears throat> Say more about that. Being a coach, yeah, not doing it, but showing how. Pointing the way, right? Helping others by pointing the way instead of uh, intervening or intercepting, right? So find things that your mentee does well and encourage him or her to pursue those interests, activities, uh, or hobbies that emphasize those skills. Again, strengths-based. It's particularly important with, with youth who are more vulnerable, who are having um, more difficulty in life with anxiety or other kinds of things. Remember I talked about how vulnerable they feel, and so if you can hone in on something that they do well, and that they're passionate about and try to really build on that. My experience has been that it, that it can be very, uh, very helpful, even life-giving for them. Help your mentee see that skills that she or he has are portable. So if you're a creative person, let's say your, your mentee is artistic. Well, uh, you may be able to draw and paint and, and, and sort of create that kind of stuff, but how is that portable into other facets of your life? in school, in the community, in the uh, faith community? How, how are those skills and those interests portable? How can they be transferred to other areas where he or she feels less skilled or more vulnerable? Yes? I did that with one of our youth who I've known most of his life, but most recently I, I was looking for a piano teacher for my child. Yeah. And the idea came, he took all of you <clears throat> Yeah. She felt That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try to paraphrase what you said beautifully, right, so that we can capture this. So you had a kid who, had, uh, who was musical, very musical, talented, and you encouraged this kid to help someone else learn to play music. And, and that was a successful kind of thing, and it empowered the not only the one who was learning, but also the one who was teaching in this, in this case, right. Yeah, so, I mean, think about being a kid who's struggling with something, having a talent, being encouraged by a mentor to share that talent with someone else, being good at that, and, and receiving some positive feedback. About it. I mean, Phil touched on how important it is to have positive peer feedback for adolescents, right? So what, what's more um, significant than an experience like that that you're describing? So thank you. Any other examples of something like that to identify a strength or a skill and, and help a kid uh, uh, transport that to some other kind of relationship? Yeah, I see some head shaking. Okay. Actively involve your mentee in making decisions that impact the completion of family tasks. Why would that be something I would mention? as a way of promoting competence. Well, why would we focus on the family unit? Any ideas? Yes. Perhaps you might have um, a person who isn't affirmed in the family, and that's the first place where they're supposed to know the unconditional love. Yeah. And if it doesn't exist there, that's going to contribute to the low self-esteem, and then feel even less in the eyes of their peers and in other adults that they look up to. Yeah, well, well said. Does everybody hear that? So the family unit, despite what adolescents will, will tell you as they look you in the eye, they really do care about the family unit. They still care about their parents, even if they're separating uh, in developmentally appropriate ways and spending more time with their friends and the things that adolescents do. They, they still care deeply about the family unit, their, their parental relationships, their sibling relationships. They want to make sure that home base is, 
is predictable, right? And so if you can help adolescents identify ways to build their sense of competence, not only outside of the family unit, but particularly within the family unit, in this case, by virtue of participating in family decisions that are significant, um, that, that's really a significant opportunity to, to build that relationship in ways that we know last over um, a lifetime. So I want to make sure you get this. Youth will tell you and show you that they want to separate oftentimes from their, their families of origin. Um, they don't really want to separate. They want to sort of try out some distance, but they want to be able to come back and check in um, and reconnect in ways that are meaningful to them. So be aware of that and, and keep that in mind as you're looking for ways to promote competence. I'm, I'm just being a little bit of a pest with the mic because we're broadcasting this around the world, but they can't hear you unless you're on the mic. Now I'm feeling anxious that you said that. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. The, the opposite of that is if you don't give them uh, a family task, then they're going to have problem with relating uh, with outside relationships, work, peers at school, because they're not used to being involved. So it's just, it, it, if you don't uh, show them how important, how valuable they are to the family unit, then that's going to translate in their later years in their adult, and they're going to have problems relationally uh, with other people. Yeah, I agree. Well said. Thank you. Look for opportunities to turn mistakes, whether they're trivial or serious, into teachable moments. Human beings make mistakes, we're fallible. We don't just do it in childhood or in adolescence, we do it across the life cycle. Um, rather than, than focusing on um, the mistake itself, look for opportunities to help kids see those as teachable moments. And how would you do it differently? What would you do next time differently uh, that you didn't do this time? How will you learn from this? Uh, really a significant life skill. Confidence. Make sure your mentee has a convoy of support so that he or she feels loved and valued every day and everywhere. So um, inherently valued as a human being is what all of us want to experience, I think. From, from those that we care about uh, most in particular, our family, our friends, our, our teachers, our mentors. We want to be valued for uh, for who we are, and, and told that who we are matters um, because we are who we are, not because of what we do, but because of who we are. So make sure that you have those kinds of supports uh, or that you encourage the development of those kinds of supports in your mentee's life. Share your own life woes and lapses. Now, this can be challenging, but um, I think Phil was getting at this when he was encouraging you, know, you to encourage kids to interview their parents about their own experiences. Uh, share your own life woes and lapses, your mistakes and confidence, and ask your mentee for help when you can. This is one of the distinctions in a mentoring relationship, that it, it's more mutual, perhaps, in other kinds of relationships, because the mentor uh, will be um, asked to be vulnerable too, right? So it's not, the vulnerability do, doesn't just work one way, if you will, on the part of the mentee but we're inviting more vulnerability as we ourselves are, are becoming more vulnerable. Um, which, by the way, I think is a, is a deeply Christian virtue, historically, to practice uh, vulnerability with, with others, even as we're asking them to be vulnerable uh, with us. Be especially attentive to obstacles that may challenge girls, if your mentee, uh, your mentee is a girl. Because we know that compared to boys in adolescence, girls' levels of confidence tend to dip more. Do you know that? This is pretty consistent across time, too. Boys' confidence will dip at a later developmental period um, if it dips. But we know that girls struggle more with self-esteem and maintain confidence at earlier ages than boys typically do. There are lots of reasons for that. We probably don't have time to go into them. One of them is that girls tend to mature faster than boys, and so um, there's that, that piece. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's good or bad. I'm just trying to recognize it as, as developmentally what tends to, to happen. And so girls are going to experience, uh, they're going to be faced with life experiences that, that older kids or grown-ups are faced with, typically a year, maybe two years earlier in some cases than, than boys will. So it, 
it, it challenges them at an earlier time in their lives, typically, not in every case, and will be the case for boys. So know that about, about girls if you're mentoring girls. Um, help increase youth social capital, really important by connecting boys or girls to institutions and to people that they might not otherwise have access to. Mentors can be networkers for young people. They can connect them uh, to communities and to resources that they may not have access to. Look for those opportunities to do that with your, uh, with your mentees as a way of building their, their confidence. I'm going to pick up a little speed here. Connection. Respect your mentee's privacy, really important. But appreciate that privacy can be perilous. Be respectful, but be vigilant. So mentors will oftentimes have entree into kids' lives that others, including parents, won't have. Treat that with respect and a kind of sacredness, if you will. But, but also be vigilant when that needs to be challenged in ways that that adult figures are appropriately challenging. Create opportunities in your community so that your mentee feels that her voice or his voice is being heard. All youth, again, want to feel like that they matter, that they're inherently valuable, that they have contributions to make. Character, if you don't um, approve of a friend or a relationship or an activity, tell your mentee that you don't approve. Not in a judgmental, a harsh kind of way, but raise up in a question form, perhaps, um, for the mentee to consider whether this is a life-giving relationship, a life-giving activity, a healthy activity, et cetera. Let your mentee know what your values are and explain why some behaviors in your judgment are not acceptable. Maybe they're not age appropriate. Maybe they're never appropriate. Uh, I think the mentoring relationship should be founded on uh, a premise that when that's called for, um, you're willing to uh, make those observations. Again, I said this, make sure your actions align with your words. Practice what you preach. After all, you are the model for your mentee. And authenticity, again, is really um, significant for this group. Keep a sense of perspective, and I would not even say sometimes, but almost all the time, a sense of humor. That'll go a long way. And let minor infractions be minor infractions. Um, don't suggest that they're a deviation in character or somehow a blight on their personhood. You know, we all make mistakes and we all have bad judgment sometimes. Provide opportunities for your mentee to make his or her own decisions and when you can uh, give him or her this opportunity, uh, live with the decisions that he or she makes. So autonomy is really an important value to, to recognize and to promote. Caring, we know what caring is. Keep in mind that when mentees treat us as if we're disposable, maybe when they need us most. This gets again to this sort of separation, convergence kind of uh, dynamic. So if a mentee is pushing you away, if they're critical of you, uh, if they're less forthcoming with wanting to be with you, that might very well be the time when they need you most. So don't suffocate them, but keep offering invitations to um, stay connected and to develop that relationship. They may tell you they don't want you in their life, but oftentimes they really do is my point and they need you. Caring is contagious. Caring mentors help develop caring youth. We know that. So model the kind of authentic caring that we're talking about in all of your relationships, with your mentee, but with other people too, because they're watching you. Um, one of the things I learned about parenting is your kids are always watching you at your more stellar moments and seemingly particularly at your less stellar moments. Um, and when your kids go, get old enough, they'll start pointing that out for you, and it makes you... Uh, Glad on the one hand that they're pointing it out, but sad on the other hand that you're blowing it as a parent. So, um, so practice what you preach and remember that caring is contagious. Encourage mentees to join things like boards and organizations or institutions that promote caring and social justice in the world around them so that they can make the kinds of contributions that we've been, uh, we've been talking about. Um, don't overprotect your mentees from failure. I think this is one contribution that mentors can make, speaking personally, that many parents of my generation fail at. We overprotect our kids. We are helicopter parents. We uh, script too much of their lives. Amen? Okay. Maybe this is just me, but uh, I've heard of this happening. Um, mentors can, can, can protect kids in different ways, perhaps, 
um, but open up kids to experiences that may be a little more risky, appropriately risky, but a little more uh, risky. So don't overprotect your mentees from, from failure. So I want to uh, close this section and pass it back to Phil, but I want to mention two more things uh, by way of, of definition. Skip told Phil and me today that the best definition of joy wins an enormous monetary prize. And so I went back to the hotel and I really started trying to craft my definition of joy so that I could at least be in the running. Um, if, Phil, if I win, I'm splitting it with Phil, and if he wins, he's splitting it with me. So I want to define a couple of things. Um, I think of joy as being something like a sense of home, at homeness in the world, a sense of being at home in the world uh, that's joined to an impassioned trust in one's inherent value as a human being. So a sense of at homeness in the world, of being in one's proper place in the world, joined with an impassioned trust in one's inherent value as a human being. I think for me, joy is at least that. I'm not saying that's exhaustive, but it's at least that. And if it's something like that for you, you can think about mentoring and supporting people in your ministries in ways that help them feel, uh, help them create a sense of more at-homeness in the world, and as importantly, help them internalize this um, self-understanding of having inherent worth as a human being. Regardless of what they do, regardless of their successes or their failures, that they're inherently valued as a human being, and in our case, as a child of God, um, I think is at least what joy uh, requires. And so for me, that means that, that anxious adolescents need um, to find ways or be helped to find ways to create these spaces in their lives where they can tell their story authentically and be celebrated for doing that. Even if that story is hard to hear, even if that story doesn't map onto my story as their mentor uh, or as their pastor or as their parent, but to create those spaces, to, to tell their own stories, which again may evolve over time, take on different contours, different narratives, and to be celebrated for doing that because of their inherent value as human beings. I think that's what, at least what we can do as adults in their lives to help them create this kind of joy that we're talking about uh, tonight. Phil. Thank you. I got a dollar. So I'll split it with you. Yeah, I got nothing when I tried mine out earlier. So 50 cents for each of us. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate that. Well, I'm going to try out uh, some thoughts here on practices of joy. Um, but pedagogically, we might be reaching that limit of hearing from someone, right? So you might be reaching that point where you're starting to say, wow, I just drove a long way to get here. Someone came from Ithaca or something. But, so just turn, turn to your neighbor and say, what are some things that you see bringing joy in uh, your, your youth ministry? And we'll do this for just a couple, more, couple minutes um, in pairs uh, as a way of kind of generating conversation. And then I'll just kind of jump into my next part after some conversations. You got the question? What are practices of joy for anxious teens?
Come on back, everyone. Come on back. I got time for three. Maybe clap once. Maybe clap twice. Maybe clap twice. So can I just hear from three of you around the room? Um, so yeah, thanks, Skip. Who, who wants to start us off? And try to just say kind of concisely. Yes, we got one. I say that most of our youth really enjoy unstructured time mm -hmm. because they don't get to do it very often. So just the beginning portion of our night together when we're just hanging out and waiting for people to gather, they love that. Mm -hmm. They love that. Beautiful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Right, right over here. Um, sometimes it's about getting them out of the comfort zone. You know, like, it's really good at one thing. But then, okay, let's go play golf. Right? Let's try it. Might not be something that you ever thought you would do, but get out there and give it a shot. Mm -hmm. You might be great at it, you might be terrible at it, but it gives them an opportunity to try something new and get outside their comfort zone. Kind of like going to it down the street mm -hmm. with Jordans, climbing on the ropes, you know, getting them up high. You know, at first they think, oh man, I can't do this, it's scary. But then they take that first step, and then before you know it, they're walking all over the ropes with the harness on. Beautiful so, put. Yeah. yeah. So unstructured time, do something different. Uh, there was someone else back there. OK, and this will be the last one, and then I'll move on. Yeah. Thank you. These are just going to fit perfectly into what I'm going to say, too. So this is it's great. Well, I've noticed that kids, especially younger kids, uh, have very creative, active minds. And it seems to bring them a lot of joy when you allow them some sort of a, outlet to express that, some sort of uh, creative control over designing their own activities that they're, that they're going to be doing. Beautiful. Did I plant you all for this? Because it's, it's all going so well together. This is great. Um, thank you for that, Skip. The, um, I, I prom made myself promise I would do a brief plug for Austin Seminary and one of our programs. I'm sorry, we just had time for three there. Uh, I promised I would do a, a quick plug for Austin Seminary and one of our programs. We have a Master's of Arts in Youth Ministry um, that's for people who are just interested in youth ministry and involves coming onto campus about uh, when classes are on for three weekends in a semester and then you do your coursework outside that time. Um, and it's run with the Center for Youth Ministry Training, cymt.org. So if you're interested in that, um, that might be something that, you wanna, that you'd be interested in exploring. Okay, I'm done with the ad. All right. Uh, so keep, can you keep in mind what our friends just said for practices of joy as we enter this last section? Um, we feel joyful when we feel kept in mind by another. I'll say that again. We feel joyful when we feel kept in mind by another. That's, increasingly, that's my definition of pastoral care, is keeping someone in mind. Um, and that actually helps them feel remembered by God, and it connects them to community. It's kind of like what Alan was saying about connection. Um, so pastoral care with adolescents facing anxiety reflects the God of Psalm 139, who keeps us in mind and has a special plan for our teens. There's even a psalm that coins the phrase that we're all the apple of God's eye, which I think is this, this beautiful uh, phrase from Psalm 17. Um, when I was a camp counselor, I read Psalm 139 with this fearful and insecure teen and was amazed. Um, she was amazed when I read that she was fearfully and wonderfully made. And she says, was that written about me? And I was, I was like, yes. And everything else I've done in ministry has been an incidental footnote to that. So uh, forgive the white Jesus here, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to give you an attachment image here because I think we as caregivers need to find our still point, our rest, and our center of gravity in God's unconditional love for us as we attempt to help anxious teens. In a highly competitive and image-conscious culture, 
Teens need to have a break from evaluation and play. And when we play with teens, they relax and feel known, and this helps them tell their stories. So I think kind of what everybody was saying here about practices of joy. In other words, you can't give it unless you got it, you know? So uh, there's some time for you to kind of let this sink in as well. It looks like for teenagers, empathy is the gateway to joy. So teen girls who could respond to a friend's distress were also more likely to experience joy with them. Um, And I think something similar happens with teenagers uh, when you kind of settle down and take the time to be present with them. Um, I'm going to suggest some practices in this section that involve being kind of goofy. And I think that kids today need a chance for you to not be serious so that they can work out their anxiety and conflicts with you. They need a a chance for kind of the high stakes life they live to be brought down a little bit. And you can help them in some unstructured ways of kind of mastering the conflicts or traumas that they're going through um, by you being the fall guy or fall girl, fall lady, whatever. So that we had this definition already, the kind of things we do to create new forms of seeing, knowing, and being in the world. Uh, I don't think I'm going to say anything about that right now. Headwinds, tailwinds, hypothesis. This is one of my favorite things lately. Um, So it looks like one of the things, joy often goes hand in hand with gratitude and the feeling of the world being bigger than ourselves and our own experiences. Isn't that the kind of teenager you want to encounter? A teenager who feels like the world is bigger than themselves and their experiences? They're kind of curious about the world and they want to engage it. Um, researchers have proved recently that we all feel the headwinds against us more readily. Democrats and Republicans alike feel like the deck is stacked against them. Everybody feels their headwinds more strongly than they feel their tailwinds. Everybody remembers the negative comment they got more than they remember the things that brought them here, right? So I think it's helpful every chance we get to ask kids about their tailwinds. What's brought you here? It's, you could say, you know, what's, what are you grateful for? But I think tailwinds is a nice way to ask it. And we do this at our family uh, around the dinner table. Um, we ask every person in the family, what are some tailwinds? What's the tailwind for today? And uh, we all share kind of the most intimate parts of our lives this way, inadvertently. But it's a way of being grateful. There's other ways of being grateful, too. You could keep a gratitude journal. If you write even four or five things you're grateful for every day, you sleep better, um, you get instantly get mental, better mental health in just two or three weeks. Um, but another way to do this is just ask about tailwinds. What's brought you here? What's, uh, p- what's pushed you into this place? Um, who's been behind it? Even marginalized teens can find small moments to be grateful for as they talk about tailwinds. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, joy as an antidote to anxiety. Joy can help us feel less self-conscious. Do you, do you remember that thing I said about teens always feeling more conscious of themselves than like it's maybe warranted? Uh, joy gives a moment for kind of releasing that self-confident, uh, self-consciousness in fun. Um, our playful joy is a result of God's image in us and the way that God tries to get close to us. Joy is actually one of the chief ways that God communicates with the soul and tries to get close to us, tries to get union with us. It's It's one of the fruits of the spirit. Yeah, belongs with a bunch of others that are quite beautiful as well, but it's one of the fruits of the spirit. Joy is non-possessive but holding. I was thinking about Alan's beautiful description of mentoring here. Um, Joy allows the other to be fully themselves while giving them a chance to grow. Um, This is a really important one for for ministry with teenagers. Joy allows troubled kids, the identified patients, that parents want you to counsel to flourish without fixing. There's nothing that kids hate more than being, becoming that problem, right? And if you could do anything in your ministry, if parents come to you with a kid they want to drop off to counsel or something like that, if you could kind of switch that dynamic and counsel the parents and focus on the parents' problem a bit, uh, kids, get, kids love that. They get really interested in that. <laughs> but be, be careful about taking the bait when someone presents you a kid who's a problem, because that's gonna shut down that conversation with that kid. 
You want to do everything you can to get them out of the identified patient position in their family. Because usually that, we can't go into this now, but usually that identified patient position is the result of the parent's conflict rather than what the kid is going through right then. So it's more helpful to focus on the parents there. Um, finally, uh, joy involves questioning the norms and visions of one's community. Uh, it allows rebellious teens to question the group and your ideas. So joy is part of what gives uh, space for kids to be themselves. Um, joy allows oneself to be oneself, but also not to need to be oneself. Whoa, does that make sense? Uh, everybody's encouraging you these days to be yourself, but sometimes kids need a chance to not be themselves too for a while. Uh, so this is uh, Jean-Michel uh, Basquiat uh, when he was a teenager. Uh, I like his art and this picture of him as a teenager. So joy allows teens to try on different identities but not hold strictly to any of these identities. Joy also allows kids to let go of control. Um, we Joy is about leaving home but also having a place to return. This is Patricia Arquette from one of the most moving parts of the film Boyhood. I don't know if you've seen that. When she's about to kind of let go of her son and she's like, what? She's a single mom. She's like, I did this all for you, and now you're going away to college. It's just one of those moments. Um, you know those moments? Yeah, one of those. Joy allows kids to be somewhere where they're recognized for who they are. This is really important in youth ministry. Um, being somewhere where you can be recognized for who you are, and you could do this for a little while with a kid, and then they might come back. So even if they leave your care or your youth ministry, if you've done it with them for a while, it lasts, and they know that you're a safe place to return to. So the need to kind of be recognized when you walk in the door and have your name known, and then have people kind of return to your story, know something about your story, tremendously powerful. Um, I've heard about some of you doing that ministry all the time, that being the heart of your youth ministry. So you're famous for that, yeah. Um, I think, I have this thing on attachment play. Um, maybe I can go through it kind of quickly. Aletha Solter, uh, who's a PhD, wrote a book called Attachment Play. And this is a cutoff picture from the uh, title cover of the book. Um, she developed attachment play as a way for children to release tension and experience joy. And I think many of these ideas can, you're already doing in youth ministry and can be adapted to your youth ministry. Um, her games release tension and allow kids to work through difficult emotions in an environment free from blame. So let me give you some examples of these really quickly. Non-directed, teen-centered play. This is when you leave objects in, and props in a room before a youth ministry event and then just see what kids do with them. You don't tell them what to do. You don't do anything. You just see kind of what they do with them. Way more interesting. Um, symbolic play. Symbolic play is when you, in, you bring in something that stands for something else that the kid is struggling with, like a test or a relationship, and then you let the kid mess with it however they want to. So you let them kind of have mastery over it. You crinkle the test up, or uh, I don't know what you do. Whatever you do, it's just kind of like, Rituals to kind of loosen some of the anxiety. That's what symbolic play is. Um, it, it's a, okay. A contingency play. Contingency play is, I think you mentioned this, where you let the kids choose the adventure, okay? So you get into the youth group room and you say, this is going to be a choose, the event, choose your adventure night, and you let kids kind of map what happens. And you're, you're surprised with them. You play with them, uh, you kind of really get into it, laugh, fall on the floor, do whatever you do to get out of your adult self. Contingency play allows kids to control the direction of the events. Nonsense play is that release that comes from making no sense for a while. Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky poem and any variation that you have of that, anything that just lets kids not make sense for a little bit. Separation play, this we always do a lot. 
It means chasing, hide and seek, but it's a deep attachment thing. Because kids, when they play uh, capture the flag or hide and seek, they're working out separation issues. They're working out attachment issues. Um, and so uh, that's actually one that we do quite a bit. Um, power reversal games, okay. These are games where you're in the dunk tank or you let your head get shaved for the youth ministry or something like that. Uh, those are times when you let yourself kind of, as the leader, get humiliated for the sake of the group. And they love this. It, puts, it gives them psychic control and it gives a kind of release for you to play with them in this way. Um, regression games are when you let kids be babies again for a little while. Uh, I don't, I don't have a bunch of great examples about that, but you let them goof off while giving them a break from their dignity. And you kind of imagine what it might be like to be young again. Uh, bodily contact games, we do a lot of these, uh, the closeness and human connection that comes from these. And then cooperative games. This would be the most important thing I think I would say. Um, all of these games, I think we should do, get rid of youth ministry games that are competitive and change them all into cooperative games. There's too, there's too much going on that's stressing kids out in our culture, and when they come into a youth ministry setting and you're instantly playing icebreakers that someone's winning or losing, you need to find a way to playfully unsettle all that. Um, and you, hopefully you could uh, humiliate yourself in the process, or just be really silly, or like make a buffoon out of yourself in the process of leading them, right? Because they need a chance to kind of challenge authority and, um, yeah, just be silly for a while. So I think these, these games give overstressed and overprogrammed kids a chance to release the energy they carry around with them in an atmosphere that tolerates mistakes, even better if it can be joined with art and nature. You can tell these games are going well if there's humor and if everyone can get in the zone. But I don't mean the kind of humor that's at somebody else's expense. Um, sometimes you can just do what-if games, relying on fantasy, um, allowing kids to have their imaginations and tell stories. Tell me that story again, but tell it differently. What would happen if something else had changed? Could you tell that story again? And you kind of play with, play with the outcomes there. Um, and I think all of these games have a chance to reflect a God at play who may have used joy in the very dance of creation. So for me, joy is that ability to transcend oneself, to transcend the every, everything that people thought were possible for you, and receive yourself as a gift from the future. It comes in moments when you feel like you don't have to prove yourself, most of all. Um, and it comes in moments like, like this of, of joy or release or, or play. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there and then let's turn for questions, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So we wanted to leave some time for questions, discussion, if you have things you want to talk about that we touched or didn't touch or need to say more clearly than maybe we said it the first time. Yes. I had a question. I know in the beginning your list was not all inclusive, but uh, when you were giving some of the aspects of anxiety and how it uh, acts out, I didn't hear you say anger. Uh, and uh, if you said it, I didn't hear it because a lot of times, uh, and especially when you're dealing with youth and adolescents, it's displayed in anger. Yeah, I may, I may not have used the, the term anger, but when I talked about conflicted relationships or oppositional behavior, and, but you're absolutely, I mean, anger is part and parcel with anxiety uh, in many cases. So thank you for pointing that out. No, I, I probably should have said it more explicitly. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anger can often be a manifestation of anxiety. Uh, I shared this with a, a couple of people uh, already t uh, this evening. I'm going to read something uh, when I'm when I'm at when I'm. Uh, I shared this with a couple of people here already. I, when I'm at home uh, with the TV off and I'm just sitting there or reading, uh, some things go through my heart, through my uh, through my mind, 
uh, and uh, I just like to jot them down on a piece of paper. And it, and it, it has a, a lot to do with the youth also. And this is what I wrote. God is not going to give us his full love until we get to heaven because he wants to see what we can do to help each other first. Are there other questions? Thank you. I'm just curious about this. Say you have someone who's new, they're from another country, the English may not be totally up to par, sometimes they're difficult to understand, maybe they talk too quickly or something. Um, what's a good way to introduce them and to eat, because I'm sure they're anxious with regard to that. What do you suggest is a good way to decrease, help to decrease the anxiety and introduce and try to integrate them into an existing group? Just a couple initial thoughts. Um, you might uh, spend some time asking them about aspects of their culture or experience that they'd like to be introduced to the group, maybe. Um, and when you introduce the person, you might also kind of buddy them up with someone who is interested in where they come from or their experience. Um, and then your job as a youth minister is to try to build some bridges to that experience. So find out what you don't know about their cultural background and where they grew up and maybe their family dynamics and those kinds of things. Often families will be kind of acculturating at different levels. So there'll be different generational dynamics there. And you want to support kids as they're kind of in the stress of being brokers, I think, a lot of times between uh, first-generation first family members and other uh, family members. Those are initial thoughts. Just in response to your question, um, at our church several years ago, we actually had um, people from our congregation that belonged to, uh, we're a very varied group, um, mostly Latino or Hispanic, but from all of the, you know, several countries. And what we had done was we had people come in and bring foods and bring um, flags and things like that from their countries. And we shared and we just had a time of fellowship. And one of the things that happened that I noticed, and I'm sure uh, our leadership noticed as well, was that it kind of melded us. It kind of made us see how familiar we are in so many areas that we didn't know. And then, you know, to kind of uh, become familiar with the areas that we were not. And I think sometimes in, in that diversity, in exploring that diversity, we can recognize that the body of Christ is vast and it is broad and it makes us more cohesive when we know each other's differences. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's very helpful. And I, as you both were, were uh, offering those uh, experiences and suggestions, I was thinking of a couple of additional things that, that I would want to underscore. One is, I think conveying genuine, authentic interest in another person's experience goes a long way. Even if there are language barriers, even if there are cultural differences that are pronounced or um, you know, seemingly difficult to translate, I think showing genuine interest in the other person's experience I mean, opens up 80% of maybe what needs to, to happen. I think spaces are really important, and so having um, symbols and art and um, literature that, that is inclusive is, is really important. And so, you know, if there, if there are flags in your building, have flags from different nations. If there are, you know, depictions of human beings have different races and ethnicities and nationalities, depicted to just show without saying anything that this is a welcoming space that values diversity, that sees diversity as, um, as God's desire perhaps for humanity. I think that's really important. And a third piece, I think kids are better at this than grown-ups are. And so empowering kids in your congregation, kids and youth to be brokers for those conversations or conduits for those conversations, 
think can be really helpful. Kids, in my experience, anecdotally, but also what I know about the research on this, they, they, they don't see difference nearly as immediately as we grown-ups do, right? And so you can utilize that, that way of being in the world to, to be a conduit for the deeper kinds of relationships that we're all wanting, I think, to have with, uh, with people who are different. So I think symbols are really um, important. Just anecdotally, we, um, in our front yard, we, we have a sign that um, the Mennonites actually sort of, uh, as I understand it, created and started you know, selling online and things like that. And it says, in English, uh, Spanish, and Arabic, no matter where you come from, we're glad you're our neighbor. And I think, I mean, that's, that's anecdotal, but I think it, it, we hope that sets a tone for the kind of space that you want your family to, to be indwelling or, or your, your uh, congregation to be. Uh, without saying much of anything, you've sort of symbolically already said it, and I think that opens up avenues for deeper kinds of relationships. Um, just a couple more resources that I thought of when you were talking, Alan. Thanks for that. Um, three different graphic novels that I use sometimes. Uh, one is called American Born Chinese by Jean Luen Yang. And that, that actually, the comic book shows what it's like to show up and then like have your, someone be like, oh, you're from China. It's like, no, I'm from San Francisco. You know, and then you're like, oh, no, you're the Asian kid. And then it's like, no, uh, I'm not gonna date the Japanese girl, you know? So like all the microaggressions you get to see in these comic books. Another one that I like is called Anya's Ghost by Vera Broskol. Um, and a third one I'll mention is Marble Season by Gilbert Hernandez. I think all those, uh, and all of them have depictions of racism that kids can see and understand. Like when um, they look at them and they open up conversations with youth, I find, around who gets to fit in and who doesn't um, in a helpful way. Thank you for um, bringing up the racism issue that was on my mind as I looked at the slides. But the other uh, aspect um, that kills joy um, is all of the violence that we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, in the high schools mm -hmm. and um, how it's killing their joy. And can you speak to this issue of how our teens, kids are expected to deal with that you know, it's not just them just growing up and talking to them about the importance of, you know, being compassionate and all of these other things, but there's a, this other force yeah. that's imposed upon them yeah. uh, that frequently gets in the way of their joy. So could you just talk to us a little about, you know, um, how we work <clears throat> with them um, when those kinds of tra tra tragedies um, are imposed um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a huge, timely question, and I, I don't presume to have a definitive answer, but let me share a couple of thoughts that, that may further the conversation a bit. Um, I think what you're pointing to is real. I, you know, one of my daughters, uh, who's 10, uh, was talking about feeling anxious now about going to school in elementary school, not even a, a middle school or a high school. So it's trickling down into younger and younger uh, age settings and school settings in particular. So I think kids are, are identifying this in their own experience and articulating it in ways that we need to pay attention to. Um, it's not something that we're um, imagining, it's, it's real. Um, we know some other things too. In, in most cases, if you look at, at, at kids who do school shootings, there, there are some patterns that we know are fairly, um, fairly predictive, actually. Not that everyone who displays these patterns will end up acting violently, but many who do will, if you look close enough, will, will, will um, demonstrate these kinds of patterns historically in their lives. W one of them, is social isolation, right? And um, oftentimes feeling alienated from peer groups, from family groups, low self-esteem, um, being bullied. You know, the kinds of things that we've all been talking about and thinking about tonight, 
So that if, we, if we're more aware and we intervene earlier, perhaps that is one way we can help to, um, uh, to change those, those outcomes. I, I think there are a lot of factors that we don't have time and space to talk about, but I, I do think what we've talked about tonight, anxiety, depression, social isolation, bullying, we didn't talk much about bullying, we, we talked more about that in our interview today, cyberbullying, things like that. I think all of that is typically part of the pattern that if you look at most of these cases um, is, is, is evident. And so all the more reason to identify these kinds of struggles early on and give kids alternatives and resources. And I, and I you know, I, I hope this isn't just idealistic. I hope there's some, some substance to this. I, I think if kids feel valued inherently, as inherently having worth for who they are, um, I think that matters, and I think those are ways that we can intervene earlier and hopefully get out in front of some of these kinds of patterns that start to form at pretty early ages. So creating those spaces for those conversations and affirmations that I think all kids need. I don't know, maybe that's the best I can do on that. Hi, I just, I'm over here, he's looking for me. Where are you? I'm oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to highlight with gratitude when you had mentioned that anxiety is based on inner strife and disharmony and how anxiety is a spiritual experience. So I wanted to share my own experience with a nine-year-old boy and um, he suffers from spiritual strife. And um, so I discovered that Ignatian spirituality is a huge gift in this situation for anxiety. Yeah. Um, so quickly, we begin with acknowledging that God is present and God is listening. And then he will share a gratitude and then he will reflect upon a moment from the day. And I call it holding a moment. And then um, a feeling from the day. And then we look forward to tomorrow's being a new day. Mm. So while we were doing this, I discovered that this nine-year-old boy who happens to go to a Catholic elementary school, he felt that when I shared, and I, it's important that I say that I also come to that sacred space and I become vulnerable and I also go through those five steps on my own. That's great. And I tested him one day by being honest and I brought a desolating feeling into our prayer and he says, oh my gosh, you're talking to God. You should only bring positive things to prayer. And so all of this, and I'm so grateful for your time here tonight, tonight because as I'm hearing about the older generation of kids, of teenagers, how many little boys and girls always felt that they should only have positive conversations with God mm -hmm. because we learn that God is of good things, mm -hmm. you know? So I just wanted to bring that to surface too. So thank you for mm -hmm. calling it a spiritual experience because that's what I'm seeing. Oh, thank, you, thank you for sharing that. It's really moving. That, that, that's one of the things in your presentation tonight that really grabbed me. Uh, anxiety is a spiritual experience. Uh, and I, my experience with youth was working with a lot of international college students uh, on the campus where I served. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that impressed me when I first got there, coming from a traditional Christian background, was how mature in their faith some of these international students were, India, who were Christian. Uh -huh. And um, they taught me what I probably should have already known, that real joy comes out of anxiety or tough experiences. Psalm 35, after sorrow in the evening, joy comes in the morning. Mm. And I think you're on to something. Maybe it is the Apostle Paul, Philippians 4, who is the best teacher, one of the best teachers, on how to experience real joy in the midst of suffering. Yeah. We are living in a time, even in our nation, where young people are suffering. And they need to see um, examples of a Christian faith. 
I have nothing against, because I used to, some of the students used to, they would debate me, because they also loved, a lot of them had been taught by missionaries before they got to the U.S., praise and worship. And I would try to help them understand how important the message of hymns were. So don't forget, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, because I can jump up and shout like you, but don't forget that when you go through some difficult times, it's going to take more than a holler and a shout to bring you out. So I, you're on to something. I like it. All right. Anxiety is a spiritual experience. And if we, would, if we would stay there and not be afraid to teach that, I think we could see a lot of joy coming forth from our youth. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about social media. A lot of my post-seminary friends will take a social media fast, but this year two students in our campus ministry disconnected from all their social media. And one of them with a clinical diagnosis of an anxiety disorder talked about how much better he felt after just a few days. Yeah. And the other just said, you know, I feel less anxious when I'm not constantly checking my phone. But I wondered if that social media, if that showed up in your research. For sure. Do you want to yeah, start? Yeah. Uh, the answer is absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like uh, the book that I turn to now is iGen by Jean Tweange. T-W-E-A-N-G-E. And it's what it's nice for is it's cross, uh, it's, it's a complete sample of the United States, and it compares different generations. And it finds that um, she does a nice job arguing that social media is a key factor that leads to anxiety and depression on its own. And that kids, she notes how uh, kids right around 2010, 2011, 2012, there was this huge dip in happiness. Um, among American youth, and that's just when the smartphone epidemic took off. And she does a really nice job of explaining how they, how there might be a core, there might be actually causation there. Um, and with kids, um, there might be a variety of reasons for it, but some of the things that she notes in her book are that kids today are, tend to be a lot more cautious, they're risk averse, they're not doing the life cycle things in the way that we would expect get it going out and uh, getting a driver's license. Uh, a lot of ways in which they're, and they're not encountering their peers as much. They're staying home on their cell phones um, a lot more. And that's not, um, so she thinks it's a separate factor, not academic stress, but actually the stress of being on social media is a separate factor that's leading directly to uh, anxiety, depression, suicide risk. And she does a really nice job, in my opinion, of making that case. Um, and I think do, kids do feel better when they're not on it, but try intervening, right? right. Just try. Try separating them from their smartphones. <laughs> there, there are folks who are identifying literal addictions to, to self at earlier ages than you might imagine. And we talked a little bit about this earlier. My own sort of take on this is um, one of the pressures that, that kids increasingly face with social media is approximating a life that doesn't exist because people post things that point to kind of an ideal life. I mean, no one posts, you know, when they get out of bed in the morning and they haven't, you know, combed their hair and they're, you know, sick and, you know, wrinkled up clothing. I mean, nobody really does that. It's always sort of this ideal life. They're, they're with this group of people or they've got this clothing on or they've got this haircut or, I mean, whatever you know, about you. I don't think in many cases it depicts reality or, or it depicts one side of reality, not the other side, which is struggle and, and strife and the kinds of things that the gentleman in the back was, was noting is so important. So I, I think that's a piece of it too, that we, we all sort of participate in this without maybe knowing it sometimes and we perpetuate social norms that, that may not exist and may not be achievable, maybe shouldn't be achieved. Um, and that starts at, at earlier and earlier ages. One other thing about 
social media is on the one hand, we've never been more connected. So my daughter, who's in middle school, literally at any time of the day, unless I make her leave her phone outside of her room, can be in touch with her friends and you know, conversing and those kinds of things. So on the one hand, we've never been more connected. On the other hand, many of us would argue we've never been more disconnected with embodied relationships. So a, a virtual relationship is virtual. It's not an embodied relationship in the way that historically I think human beings have, have, have thrived on and continue to even though they're harder to, to come by sometimes by virtue of our time on social media. So, uh, But it's I, not going away, right? So we've got to find ways, I, I think, to, to make it more constructive and less destructive. I had a question right here. Where are we? Oh, okay, hi. Um, what about um, like apparently justified anxiety for kids? So Say again? Apparently justified anxiety for kids. Like if there's a big SAT coming up or yeah. AP exam, like, like I'm not gonna tell them it doesn't matter because deep down, you know, I yeah. know it's important. If they don't do well, that could have negative consequences or you know, like kids who have to face really important decisions about the future, like yeah. um, like which parent they're going to live with if the parents divorced. Um, so uh, I'm not really sure how to how to deal with anxieties that have some some justification that seem to have real import yeah. um, on their lives. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important distinction. I'm glad you you raised it. I mean, anxiety, all anxiety, isn't necessarily destructive or a bad thing. It can be adaptive, right? I mean, we, you know, at our, at our kind of core, anxiety, you know, um, helps us to flee from things that are dangerous, right? I mean, we're wired that way. And so I don't want to make it kind of all good, all bad kind of thing, but I think when anxiety gets to a point where it's debilitating, so if the kid who is stressed out about the SAT, you know, can't sleep, can't eat, is depressed, is, you know, staking his or her whole life on this SAT, then that's when I become more worried about it. Not uh, if anxiety is a motivator to invest the time in preparing for it, getting a good night's sleep, uh, those kinds of things. So I think the point you raise is, is a valid one. My own view is that, that much of what we see um, um, exceeds that kind of level of anxiety, that it, it, it crosses over into the kind of anxiety that's more debilitating in ways that we've, we've talked about. And I, I've mentioned this in other contexts. I think, I think one of the things parents can do um, is, is make sure they're not engaging in what I would call competitive parenting, which, which I think kids can, can be caught up in, and so that it's well-intentioned, almost always well-intentioned, but it starts pretty early in, in you know, um, identifying these tendencies for parents to convey to their kids, Every, you know, everything's at stake when you're in the fourth grade on your, your star test in Texas because that's going to be predictive of where you can go to middle school and that's going to be predictive of where you can go to high school. I think we need to keep that in check and, and sort of create these spaces for kids to be motivated but not saddled with, with unnecessary burdens at such young ages. So I think, I mean, there's, that's the art of, of parenting and mentoring, of trying to sort of hit that sweet spot between adaptive anxiety, um, but not letting that bleed over into maladaptive or destructive anxiety. And I might just say the one thing I would add would be, as parents, we have a gift of just accompanying our kids and saying how hard that was. You know, like, regardless of how well they do, just kind of like, our job then is just say, it seems like it was really tough, you know, and that's kind of like that accompaniment uh, that really, I think, helps build a bond with kids. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's praise or blame, and that's what you want to try to get out of. Because those, those responses aren't as constructive, I don't think. Um. And I think, if I may, just one more thought. Conveying to, to kids that this doesn't define you as a person, right? You may have blown this test. You may not have gotten into this school. You may not have had this option that you wanted. There will be other options because you have other strengths, and you'll have other opportunities. And so learn from this, harking back to failures as an opportunity for teachable moments, I think, can be really significant. So what you do on the test doesn't define who you are. It doesn't affect my love for you or my appreciation for you as your parent or your mentor. Um, those kinds of things I think can be really helpful. I just wondered if you had a few strategies um, returning to the social media question. I work with high school students and um, I've had opportunities where they themselves have said, I don't even know how to talk to somebody face to face. 
I, yeah. I feel unbelievably uncomfortable doing it. I don't know how to do it. I have no interest in trying. So what are some like concrete strategies that you can use with kids to help them develop that skill because they know how to do it with their cell phone, but when they have to just sit there and look at each other, they're not sure what to do. Thanks. You're looking at me like I have a good answer. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I go back to modeling again. So, you know, confession, you know, there have been more than, there's been more than one time when I was, you know, extolling the virtues to my middle school daughter about taking a break from her phone as I was returning an email from work, right, after I got home. And my wife appropriately sort of pointed that out to me, as did my daughter. And so, so I think, you know, modeling is really important. And so, um, you know, maybe at a certain hour, all the cell phones go into the basket and then they're, you know, off limits until morning or, or those kinds of things so that you can use that time, again, for, for more of the conversations that you're, that you're talking about. Um, there's this wonderful thing. My, my daughter um, does sleep phone-free sleepovers at other kids' houses. I mean, it sounds like, well, you know, what's the big deal? But if you're with your phone kind of all the time and you um, intentionally leave it at home and there's sort of a rule that there's no phones at sleepovers, that changes the nature of the relationship at the sleepover. And so, I mean, those are just anecdotal, but I think trying to find those sabbaticals or fasts from electronics is probably a good thing for all of us, my, myself included. Wow, what a wonderful night. I want to thank our guests, our speakers tonight for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I want to thank you for coming and for the great, great questions and comments that uh, the collective wisdom of this room had. That's the tone we hope we can have for this week. There's so much collective wisdom here. We bring it together. We all go out of here enriched. So thank you for what you bring. Remember, everyone is welcome tomorrow night. Folks that haven't thought to sign up for it are welcome tomorrow night. Tomorrow amazing speakers. Elizabeth Condé Frazier, who was a local pastor in New London, went off and got her PhD and is now the leader of Esperanza College in Philadelphia, one of the leading Latina educators in the country and faith leaders is going to be here with her colleague Ruben Ortiz. So much of this week is there are things that our kids are suffering from, like violence. We can't actually stop it. But we do have to teach them that God loves them and will see them through it, and there's a possibility of a measure of joy anyway. And tomorrow, Elizabeth Conde Frazier and Ruben Ortiz will be talking about how to walk with children through the difficulties and oppression of poverty and still understanding that they're beloved by God and finding basis for joy and resilience in the resistance. So I hope you'll join us tomorrow night. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer to send us forth, all uh, right? Just uh, before you say oh, prayer. Oh, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. My uh, boss has something to say. Go ahead. Um, before you leave, you have an evaluation, nightly evaluation on your table. Please take the time to fill that out before you leave. It's very important for how we evaluate what we do here and for what we offer in the future. So if you could please take time to fill out that evaluation, that's very important um, to us. No, thank you for that. I'm going to pray very slowly so you have time to fill it out, Okay. <laughs> Uh, God of grace from whom all blessings flow. We thank you for the blessings of Alan and Phil, for their lifetimes of scholarship and engagement and love for kids, and the way they brought that love and that wisdom and shared it with us, uh, traveling far to be with us and far from home tonight. We thank you for the blessings that flow from your hands into the lives of children through the youth pastors that are here tonight. We ask that as you send them forth, you send them forth better equipped by what they learned, better inspired by how they felt your presence here amongst us, uh, and that they are surrounded by allies in the work that they have met here tonight. We ask for traveling mercies that folks may go home safely to a night of well-deserved rest and awake tomorrow with uh, even more energy and passion for caring for these kids who were your children before they were our children. We ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, and thank you for coming.